I'll, uh, I'll have these on and off probably over the whole evening. So I apologize for that. Thank you for those of you who are here. Thank you for those of you who are watching on Zoom. Um, you know, these are difficult days and uh, <clears throat> it's hard sometimes even to, uh, to speak clearly about them. But it seems to me important that we sort of think through some of the problems that are of, of the world that, that we're in right now. And I think it is a very different world than it was just a month ago. And I think it is, uh, we are at a sort of hinge point in history where things are going to be considerably different no matter what happens in the next few months in Ukraine. So I think it's worth it to, to step back a little bit and uh, look at what people are saying, especially what Vladimir Putin is saying and why he's saying it and what he is hoping to get from what he says and what we can take from that. So I would offer sort of the short version of this talk and the long version of the talk. So the short version of the talk is when he's talking about Ukraine, um, I recommend that you play the opposite game with Vladimir Putin. So anything he says, turn it the opposite way and probably you're gonna be about right. Um, so if you need to leave now, you're fine. You, could, you can go, just, just you know, uh, go ahead and leave and, and, and take that with you. So I, I think that that's really true in a lot of ways. I think that what's happening um, in uh, what the Russians would call Putin, you know, what the, 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 the Putin years is he's developed a, a, uh, um, a way of looking, about, looking at the world and looking at Ukraine specifically that is, to my mind, totally opposite of what we might think and totally opposite from what, the, as, as, we, as we know, what the world might think about it. So the short version is that there seems to be a weird sort of opposite game going on. Um, in the longer version, I started out by, by writing five lies of Vladimir Putin, and then it, it, there was a little mission creep, and we're up to about eight. A friend of mine wrote, a colleague of mine wrote and said, just eight? And I said, well, we could go on and on and on, so I'm just picking eight right now. So I would like to talk about these things, though, and, and, and I think the important thing for us to understand is that um, Putin is not, when he's, when he's making pronouncements, He's largely not talking to us. He's not talking to you, he's not talking to me. He's talking to a different kind of audience. He's talking mostly to an internal Russian audience. So the first question that you might have is who cares? Why would he care? He's a dictator. Well, he does care, right? There is a long tradition, even into the Soviet period of wanting to develop um, uh, popular support for certain activities, for certain actions. And that the government, even if it is a dictator, dictatorial government, as it is right now, it has not always been in Russia, but it is right now, um, even so is looking and is interested in having some sort of popular support. That that's, that's an important part of their um, way of thinking about the world and their way of thinking about ruling is that they are dictators, but they are also leaders. Uh, the word in Russian is, is vojd, which means almost a chieftain, um, as someone who has a lot of popular support, who is not just a dictator in Russian, but is also a vojd, a, uh, a chieftain. And so there's a way in which he is speaking, I think, to very specific audiences. And he picks his lies, it seems to me, based on the audience that he's trying to speak to. So what happened with the beginning of the war is he needed a whole bunch of lies because he was speaking to different audiences. And so I'd like to go through some of those lies today, and I do believe that they're lies, and explain a little bit of what I think is happening in Putin's head and Putin's um, point of view on this. Well, the biggest one, the first one, so I, I have eight here, maybe we'll put a couple together, please don't count. Um, maybe I'll end up with nine, I'm not sure, but we'll, we'll pretend that there are eight. The first one, and maybe the most important one, that Putin would say over and over and over again in the last few years, but especially in the last couple of months, is that Ukraine is not a country. And indeed, there have been periods in Russian uh, imperial history and periods in the Soviet Union when Ukraine was part of either the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union. But to say that it is not a country is just a simply bizarre statement that is wrong on its face. It's wrong in every possible way on its face. Uh, he says that Ukraine is not a nation, which is to say Ukraine is part of Russia, is spiritually and historically and linguistically and religiously part of Russia. That's just simply not true. Uh, if you listen to the speeches by <clears throat> President Zelensky, he speaks often in Ukrainian first. 
And then when he's speaking then to the Russian public, he turns and switches into Russian. Well, if you speak any Russian, you'll realize that you don't know what he's saying for the first part of the talk, right? There are words that I can follow, right? And I have friends who speak both Russian and Ukrainian, certainly, but I, as someone who has only studied Russian and never spoken Ukrainian, it's very clear to me that these are two different languages. Likewise, there are two different um, uh, sort of traditional cultures. There are different food ways. Some things are the same, some things are different. Um, there are two different political histories. There are two different uh, geographical histories. Certainly Ukraine is, a, is one very specific geographic entity that has gotten bigger and smaller. It's changed in one place in one time or another. So it, but it has from oh, at least the 16th and 17th century been a particular thing. I have a, uh, a, a map up, a 17th century map on my wall um, in my office. And I was looking at it just the other day and there it says Ukraine, right? There's Muscovy up here and there's Ukraine down there, right? So it's very clear that historically, Ukraine has been linked to, related to Russia and then the Soviet Union, but in no way has it ever been the same as. And of course, we know in 1917, Ukraine had a very short period of independence. And then starting in 1991, Ukraine became an independent uh, country. It is an independent country. It has its own army. It has its own flag. It has its own seat at the United Nations. It has all of those things that a nation state has. There is simply no way logically, rationally to my mind to say that Ukraine is not. I've been trying to think of what the closest analog might be. And I think the closest thing I would say is if we were British and we were saying that Ireland was not an independent nation, that Ireland was not its own culture. The Ireland was really just little England or something like that. Well, you can imagine what the Irish would say, right? You can imagine how the Irish would react. And that's precisely how the Ukrainians react and how they should react. So number one, it is a country. When he says it's not a country, it's not a nation, it's simply not true. Second, and this is related to the first one, this is not a war, this is a spetsop. This is a special operation. Well, this is a very strange thing to do because on the one hand, if, he, if it was so clear that Ukraine was not a country and Ukraine was, as we'll say in a moment, run by Nazis, then you would think that, that Putin would be proud of going to war against Ukraine. But in fact, I think there's a, there, that this is kind of a lie upon a lie because for a country to go to war, traditionally go to war against another country, but if Ukraine is not another country, how can you be going to war for it against it, right? So logically, in a kind of perverse logic, he, I think that's one of the reasons that he says that it has to be a special operation. But I think the other reason and the bigger reason is fear that um, although Ukraine and Russia are separate entities, there is a long tradition of interaction between them. People move back, have moved back and forth easily. Um, my Russian friends have Ukrainian cousins and friends and neighbors, people come back and forth. Um, uh, a Russian friend of mine had a wonderful Ukrainian nurse for her mother for a while, this is absolutely wonderful woman. So it's not that there was no interaction between Russia and Ukraine. And I think the fear from Putin is to say, if we are going to war against Ukraine, but we all have friends and neighbors and cousins and aunts and uncles and, and, and grandmothers and grandfathers who live there, people's reaction will be, why would we do that? What's the point of that? Where if you say this is a police operation or a special operation, you can kind of fudge the idea of it being a war and hope that people won't notice, right? Of course, this is not the case. Today, um, the Russian uh, government said that it was pulling away from Kyiv, right? But except that they had only told their people that they were in the Donbass and that they weren't in Kyiv. So you have this problem of sort of lies upon lies upon lies that develop out of this. Lie number three. Uh, the Ukrainian government is made up of drug-addled Nazis. Where, where does one start on this? Um, I think that what's happening, I think that the, the, the audience for this are those um, people, especially war veterans and the children of war veterans, which is to say most of the, the Russian public that remember themselves and celebrate themselves, quite rightly, by the way, as the people who won World War II, 
the people who beat back the Nazis, in the same way that the Americans can take the most amount of uh, glory for beating the Japanese in World War II, the Russians, it seems to me, can take the most amount of glory for beating the, the Nazis in World War II, with, without question. I mean, when you think about things just simply like the number of people who died, right? The number of Americans who died in World War II is right around 300 or 350,000. The number of Soviet citizens who died in World War II is between 20 and 27 million. So the difference between 300, 350,000 and 20, and 27 million people is, is unfathomable to me as a person who lost two uncles. My mother had, had two brothers who died in the war. So there is a very strong and very appropriate pride in having beaten back the Nazis. And so, and so this is the first point. The, the second point is that, in fact, there is a right-wing party in Ukraine. It has precisely, as I, I think the last time I checked, one seat in the Ukrainian parliament. There is indeed a far-right party in Ukraine, as there is a far-right element in Russia, but it has, and there's one party, and there's also one unit of the National Guard, one part of the Ukrainian National Guard that has tended to attract these far-right people. So this is an incredibly small group of, a small number of people, but it's a very useful uh, group of people for Putin, because he can say, see, there are Nazis in Ukraine and we're going to go get rid of those Nazis. So in that case, the argument or the, the audience rather, are those people who are still very proud of Russia's part in beating back Hitler. And that memory is incredibly strong in Russia and in fact has become even stronger. So as the memory and the celebration of being the victors in the Great Fatherland War and in, in World War II, as that has been um, developed and developed more and more in, in Russia, uh, then it makes the anti-Nazi argument even stronger. The final piece to this, and again, it's one of these lies that has just a tiny kernel of truth in it that makes it all the more worse, is that there were in fact Nazi sympathizers in Western Ukraine during World War II. No question about that. We know even in Philadelphia that there was a uh, um, <clears throat> there was a court in Philadelphia that was tasked in rooting out Ukrainian emigres who came after the war and had been Nazi sympathizers and they were sent back. So we know that this exists, but we're talking about handfuls of people and certainly none of them alive now, right? But it is within the memory of Russia. And so it's a very useful trope to use against it. Does it have any relationship to uh, reality? No, none, zero. As we have heard in the news, President Zelensky um, is uh, a Russian speaker. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but he is, he's Jewish, right? So imagine how bizarre this is, right? That to say that he is the head of a Nazi government in Ukraine is just, again, on its face, absurd. It is a lie, but it's a useful lie for one part of the Russian population, one part of the Russian demographic. Four, I think we're in four. Sure, let's say we're in four. Um, that Vladimir Lenin, as the head of the Soviet Communist Party, created modern Ukraine. So this, is, uh, this came from, this lie came as part of a, uh, a talk, a, a very important speech that Putin gave, I think on the 21st of February, so shortly before the, the uh, or shortly after the war started. And uh, I, I, I've read it a number of times. I've looked at people who have tried to interpret it. And I must say, as a historian, I have no clue what he's talking about. I simply have no idea what he means. I think what he's, he might be trying to say is that the Soviet Union, when it developed, ought to have been like the Russian Empire that had different provinces, but didn't have different sort of national organizations. But the Soviet Union as was a union of Soviet socialist republics, and there were um, all in all 15 different ethnic republics in the Soviet Union, one of them being the Ukraine, um, the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. So I think what must be happening in his head is he's saying, well, if the Soviet Union had kept Ukraine within its borders and not made a separate Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, then it would be easier for us to say that Ukraine was never independent of Russia. But I must say, I simply don't have a clue exactly why he's saying what he's saying. 
I do think though that he has a specific audience and that this audience is the audience that are anti-communist, that he doesn't want people to think of him as being simply a KGB officer who's following in the lines of you know, Lenin and Stalin and, and Khrushchev and Brezhnev, especially Brezhnev and his, uh, um, his war on Afghanistan. So I think that he is signaling to a different part of the population Right, sorry, I have a spam call coming in. Um, this is, uh, let's turn it off. Um, the, uh, so the, uh, uh, I think that, that that little part of the audience is the part of the audience that says, we don't want the Soviet Union to come back. And so I think he's saying there, this really is not the Soviet Union, this is something else. Take this off. I could get it, I could, well, no, it'll, it's, it's for my car. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so five, Americans, Americans control the Ukrainian government. This is perhaps slightly less absurd than Nazis controlling the American government, but only slightly less absurd, it seems to me. And I believe what's happening is this. Um, first, he's conflating American support of the, of the, a Ukrainian government and American support for the Ukrainian military, he's conflating that with Ukrainian with Americans running or controlling the, uh, uh, the Ukrainian government. But this is part of a larger uh, argument that Putin sometimes makes and Putin's lieutenants sometimes make, which is that the Americans control all of Europe. Right, <laughs> right. Um, and this is simply not true, right? The, the, but the idea here is that America is um, the puppeteer behind NATO. America is the puppeteer behind the EU. The Amer America is the puppeteer behind, you know, international atomic agencies. So America is the puppeteer running all of these things, right? It's simply an inability from Putin's point of view to imagine that people who live in these countries might have their own points of view that they might have their own ideas, they might have their own uh, um, opinions, because it's not very useful for him for there to be people in Ukraine or Belgium or Belarus or Poland or Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania who might have opinions that he doesn't agree with, right? It's much easier simply to say Americans are telling them what to do as if all of those people in Europe and the rest of the world are so stupid that they just sort of fall in line. But I think they, there's an important group that he's speaking to, and it's a different group than the last one. The last one we were speaking to the people who said, well, we don't want the Soviet Union. There's also a large group of people, there's a demographic group that says, we miss the Soviet Union. We used to be the top dogs, right? It used to be us in the USA, right? It used to be you know, we, we, were, we were the two superpowers. We were the only superpowers. And you know, that was cool, right? We felt important when we were one of the two world superpowers. And now we don't feel so important. And so partly by saying it's us versus them, it's us, the Russia, us, the, the successors to the Soviet Union against them. It's reminding that group of people that the Cold War maybe really never finished that maybe really what was happening is that Russia just was pushed back on its, uh, on its heels for a little while, and now it's taking its rightful place again as the superpower against which the United States has to, has to, uh, uh, has to struggle, right? So it's a slightly different population, a different demographic that he's, uh, he's appealing to there than he would have, be, would have been appealing to in, uh, um, in, his, in the, in the anti-Nazi or in the, um, in the, in the anti-Lenin uh, lies or, or statements. Next one, Ukrainians are planning to become a nuclear power. This, this I have to say is I think maybe the most interesting lie from a purely intellectual point of view. And he has to do some funny gymnastics here, but I think that they're useful ones to understand what's going on. So as all of you remember, you, the Ukraine, um, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union until 1991. And Ukraine became an independent nation, an independent state in 1991. You could argue it's always been a nation. It became a politically independent state in 1991. Um, but in 1990, because it was in the Western part of the Soviet Union, it had a very large Soviet nuclear arsenal. 
So in 1991, when the, when the Soviet Union fell apart and Ukraine became independent, Ukraine suddenly out of the blue became the third largest nuclear power in the world, right? Soviet Union, America, and Ukraine. The problem with this is that all of the command and control for the many, 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 many hundreds of missiles in Ukraine, the command and control for those missiles was in Moscow. Right, so they couldn't easily shoot them off, even though they had them. They couldn't necessarily use them. On top of that, nuclear weapons are incredibly expensive to maintain. And Ukraine was not in a great economic position in 1991. So it didn't have the wherewithal to maintain these and then to create command and control for the nuclear arms. And so in 1994, the United States, Russia, and uh, Ukraine um, all met in Budapest, Hungary. And they signed a, uh, I think it was called a memorandum. I should look this up. Um, yes, the Budapest Men Memorandum. It's important that it's not a treaty. It's not even an agreement. It was a memorandum. And the memorandum said that Ukraine would give up all of its nuclear arms. It, was, it, it, it would completely de denuclearize, right? And in doing so, it then asked Russia and the United States to guarantee its borders. So think of what Putin is doing, right? Putin says, we are not going against the Budapest Agreement of 1994. Those damnable Ukrainians want to get nukes back. And we said, as long as the Ukrainians didn't have nuclear arms, we would defend their borders. But now that Ukraine wants to get nuclear arms back, we're off the hook. We don't need any more to support the Budapest Agreement, the Budapest Memorandum, because Ukraine has already gone against the memorandum by trying to get nuclear arms. This is, again, simply not true. It just ain't so. There's just no evidence anywhere, and there is no logic and no rationale to think that the Ukrainian government has any desire, let alone the money, let alone the ability, let alone the contacts to become a nuclear power. It simply isn't so. But for those people who might be looking back and saying, didn't we say we were going to help out we're going to maintain uh, the borders of, the, of, of Ukraine, he can say, oh, sure, we did. But the Ukrainians have walked away from that agreement, and so we no longer have to follow that agreement. It's a bizarre sort of turn, but it's a really intellectually interesting one. And it shows, I think, part of what Putin does very well, which is to say, we didn't do anything wrong, you did it wrong, and now we're just responding to what you did wrong, right? It's not true, but it's a very powerful argument to say, we were doing the right thing, you did something wrong, and now we are simply responding to it. Oh, here's a good one. Ukrainians are persecuting Russian speakers. So as we might know, President Zelensky speaks Russian first. He speaks Russian at home. Ukrainian is his second language. It's not his first language. A good part of Eastern Ukraine, in fact, uh, is made up of people who do speak Russian first. And on the street or in the news, um, or when you're listening to President Zelensky, people will flip back and forth between English, or, sorry, between Russian and Ukrainian, often without me missing a beat. So why is it that there are all these Russian speakers in Ukraine, and why would we have to defend them? Why would Russia have to defend them against Ukraine? Well, there are a couple of things going on. One is that the eastern part of Ukraine has always been a mixture of Russian speaking and Ukrainian speaking. It has been this way from time immemorial. There has never, there has never been an obvious point 
in the eastern part of Ukraine where only Russian was spoken and only Ukrainian was spoken, in general, people in the east tend to speak Russian first. In general, people in the west of Ukraine tend to speak Ukrainian first. But that's not always the case. In general, people might speak Russian more in the south, and in general, they might speak Ukrainian more in the north, but that's not always the case. But it plays on an interesting little piece of history that is bigger than just Ukraine. And so this is the audience that uh, the Putin is speaking to here. So after World War II, the Soviet government decided that it wanted to Russify the Western part of the Soviet Union. So it forcibly or unforcibly, sometimes by force, sometimes um, by, uh, by offering jobs and things, moved Russians into Ukraine, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And they always forcefully moved Ukrainians, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians um, from their homes into the east, into Siberia, into the east of the Soviet Union. So there was a demographic flip that happened as a, po as a part of the Russification of those areas. So the idea here was that if, if the USSR wanted to integrate Ukraine, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, into the Soviet Union more completely, one way to do that would be to, for, to, to send Russian speakers, ethnic Russians into those areas and to move especially people we didn't like who were Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian or Ukrainian speakers into the, either into um, uh, just move them into the East or put them in the gulag, put them into labor camps. Right. So this was a very specific thing that happened at the end of the war. And there are now large groups of Russian speakers in all of those countries, especially in Ukraine and Latvia. So in this case, Putin, I think, is speaking to the Russian speakers of what he calls the near abroad. Those people who are ethnic Russians and living in Ukraine, Latvia, Lithuania, and, and, and Estonia who may feel like they're second-class citizens. And often, to be sure, they are treated like second-class citizens in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, especially Estonia and Lithuania. They, so the, he is speaking there not to an internal audience, but he's speaking to people that he hopes will support him by saying, well, we're Russian speakers in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Ukraine, and we feel more Russian than we do Latvian, Lithuanian, Estonian, or Ukrainian. And so we're going to support Putin in this. In fact, this has not largely happened. What's happened in those countries in Ukraine, Latvia, not Ukraine, Ukraine has been actively anti-Russian after the beginning of the war. In Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, what's happened is a generational shift that in uh, the older generation, those people who remembered perhaps as children being moved to those countries, often have a very pro-Moscow point of view. But their children and their grandchildren think of them first as Latvians, themselves as Latvians, Lithuanians, and Estonians. So even that group that, that Putin is speaking to in this pro-Russian speaking idea, this idea you might have heard it called the Ruski Mir, the Russian world, that he needs to defend all those people who are ethnically Russian wherever they might be, that is falling on deaf ears to the younger generation of those countries. I think probably it is falling on um, for some fertile ground, if I want, if we can change the, uh, uh, the metaphor to mix the metaphor, it's falling probably on some fertile ground in, uh, in the older generation. But it's a different group, I think, that he's speaking to there than he's speaking to with his other lies. We know simply, though, that it is just not true. Ukrainians are not persecuting Russian speakers. It just isn't so. Many, 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 perhaps half of Ukrainians are themselves Russian speakers. It simply is not the case. And it was, however, part of the, uh, um, also the reason for Russia to sort of create these problems in the Donbass region, because that's the area that was the most Russian speaking and the most pro-Russian. That doesn't mean that they wanted to be part of Russia necessarily, but there was people that were looking more to Russia than other parts of Ukraine. Good. Um, here's one that I think, and this I guess is my, uh, my, my eighth, I think this is my last one. Um, this is one that is uh, particularly important for, for me as a person who studies Russian religion um, and especially Orthodox Christianity. Um, as you know, the, uh, the Russian state and the Russian Orthodox Church have become kind of fused at the hip over the last 20 years. 
uh, the Russian state has very much um, gone away from the Soviet idea that we don't want to have uh, religion or we're going to persecute religion. And if, in fact, the Russian state has very actively, especially during the Putin period, has very actively looked to the Russian Orthodox Church as a partner, looking for support for its policies in the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, the Soviet Union did this too. Um, from 1943 onwards, when there was allowed to be a new patriarch and a new sort of um, somewhat openness of the Russian church and the Soviet Union, uh, Stalin went to the, to the Russian church and said, will you support us in the war against the Nazis? If you support us against, in the war against the Nazis, we will give you a little bit more freedom. But that freedom came at a very specific cost. And that was that all of the people at the top of the Russian Orthodox church in the Soviet period were in one way or another KGB informants. You simply could not be part of the hierarchy of the church without getting a knock on the door and a, uh, um, having a conversation with the KGB. This didn't mean that they were communists. It didn't mean that they were KGB agents, but it did mean that there was a constant conversation going on at the very top between the state and the church in the Soviet period, in the post-war Soviet period. Well, guess who those people are now? Those people are the very highest ranking members of the Russian Orthodox Church. So this has been a very useful thing for Putin, who himself says, thinks of himself as a very pious man. Uh, there's no question he perceives of himself as being a pious Russian Orthodox. I think he really believes that. I don't think that that's, that's cynical in him, but it's a very useful thing for the Orthodox Church and, uh, and the state to get together. And so it is also a useful thing, and it is a, a very large population, a large segment of the Russian population, for Putin to say, you know what, in Ukraine, the government is persecuting Orthodox Christians. But this is a very strange thing. It's a very difficult and delicate thing to say, because perhaps the largest single part of the Russian Orthodox Church is in Ukraine. So there are two jurisdictions of orthodoxy in Ukraine. There is the by far larger and, and perhaps more active, but certainly larger number of churches, number of parishes that are uh, part of the jurisdiction of the Russian Orthodox Church. So the Russian Orthodox Church has a part of it called the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Moscow Patriarch. So it is the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, but it is affiliated with the Russian Orthodox Church. It looks to the Russian Orthodox Church for its leadership. There is another smaller independent Orthodox Church in Ukraine that was, uh, that was it's a long, long, extremely intricate story, but for our, our, our uh, intent and purpose here, that was started just in the last few years by the Ukrainian government, this is interesting, going to a different patriarch, not to the patriarch of Moscow, but to the patriarch of, of Constantinople, and saying, would you bless us to have an independent Ukrainian church? This is within the, uh, the power of the, of the, of the um, patriarch of, of uh, Constantinople to do. He can do that. And in fact, he did. He said, yeah, sure, right? There's an American Orthodox church. We call it the Orthodox Church in America. There's a Finnish Orthodox church. There's a Japanese Orthodox church. There's a Serbian Orthodox church. There's a Czech Orthodox church. Why not have a Ukrainian Orthodox church? That's perfectly fine. But that was in many ways um, fighting words to the Moscow Patriarch who said, wait a minute, that's our Orthodox Church. But think of how bizarre this is. So on the one hand, Putin is saying, see that Ukrainian church that is not affiliated to the, to the Russian church is somehow persecuting the larger, richer, better organized, Ukrainian church that is part of the Moscow Patriarch. So he's basically saying that the very small, less powerful church is persecuting the much bigger church, right? It defies imagination to, to, to think why he would say this. With one exception, I think, and that is that the Ukrainian church, the independent Ukrainian church, tends, like Ukraine, to think of itself as part of Western Europe as part of Europe in a more general sense, not separated from Europe. And it has been a worry of the Moscow Patriarch that the Ukraine, all Ukrainian churches would go that way, 
that all Ukrainian churches would become a little too European, a little too cosmopolitan, a little too Western looking. So I think what's happening here is Putin is trying first to speak to people who are believers and saying, we have to defend our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted in Ukraine. But I think the, the, the sort of underlying political argument here is to say that we want all the Orthodox in Ukraine to be more Russian, to be more like us, to be more uh, socially conservative, to be more culturally conservative, to be more pro-government, more pro-Russian government. But it ends up creating a very difficult situation because it means that the Russian government with the blessing of the Russian Orthodox Church, with the, the leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church, which you remember they're very close and they're very friendly, but with the blessing of the Russian Orthodox leadership are actively killing the people that they're trying to save, right? They're actively bombing churches. As of this morning, I read an article that said that there are 60 Orthodox churches that have been bombed during, this, during the war so far. So it's a very confusing sort of convoluted lie to say that this persecution is happening in a country where most of the people in that, in, most of the Orthodox in that country are, by the way, affiliated with us, not affiliated with someone else, that this small minority is somehow persecuting the large majority. And so we're going to bomb everybody in order to bring unity to the church. It's hard for me to understand this as a scholar uh, and as a person who I grew up in, in the Orthodox tradition. It's a, it's, a, it's a hard thing to follow. It's a hard thing to understand. But I think that it is an important one because it um, shows up finally what Putin, I believe, is trying to do. And I think that Putin is trying to um, drive a, a clear ideological we uh, uh, wedge between Russia and the rest of the world. Right, what he would call Eurasia and Europe in the West. And I think he's doing that for a couple of reasons. One, I think he truly believes that the West is wrong, that democracy is wrong, that equality is wrong, that gender rights is wrong, that gay parades, as the, uh, as the patriarch said, uh, are, are somehow sinful and wrong. I think he really believes that. But I think in the cynical half of him, also believes that it's an incredibly useful thing for there to be a split, even an iron curtain between the West and the East, because in doing so, it will make his people look to him for support rather than looking to NATO or looking to the EU or looking to America or looking to anyone else. So I think there's a mixture here on the one hand of his true belief that he really thinks this is, this is the case, that he's really the good guy and everyone else is the bad guy. But I think there's a cynical reason here too that says, I will stay in power longer with greater support if my people will follow me and my people will support me. The problem it seems to me is that in order to do this, he has to lie. And those lies can only last for so long. Right? As our parents all told us, the problem with lying is you have to keep lying in order to cover your last lies. And I think that's precisely what's going to happen. So let me follow, or follow or finish up with just one idea here. I'll give you an example of how this might happen or how this is, I think, starting to happen now. One of his lies that I didn't mention was that Putin said that there were no dra uh, draftees that were going to go into Ukraine. Right? It would only be professional soldiers. We know this is not the case. We know the draftees were sent. So the reason this is important, though, is that the draftees in the Russian army tend to come from poor rural areas. There are various reasons for that, but they tend to come from poor rural areas. Those poor rural areas are the, are the areas that only get Russian state TV. So those poor rural areas tend to be the areas that most strongly support Putin. But imagine what happens now that first he lies and says, your boys are not going into Ukraine. And even if they are, it's not a war. It's just a little police action. And then 
the large number of people who are coming back in body bags, the, the sons, the brothers, the husbands, the grandsons that are, going, that are now starting to come back in body bags. And it's at this point, I think, where Russian people who are not stupid, certainly, but have been hearing a whole number of lies may begin to say, these are lies, because my boy was a conscript. My boy wasn't in, supposed to be in Ukraine. My boy wasn't supposed to be in a war, and my boy was not supposed to be dead, and now he is. So I think, unfortunately, it's the suffering of, of Russian people in a very family by family way that may start to undercut these lies that Putin has told. Thank you. Please feel free to leave if you should feel like you should. That's totally good. That's fine. Okay. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Robson, for, for presenting. That was extremely enlightening, uh, I know for me. So what we're going to do now is if you have a question, feel free to come up to the mic here. Uh, and if we need to, we can go back and forth between uh, in-person questions and questions on Zoom. Is there anything on Zoom right now? Okay, well, I'll get us started with our first question, and then you guys can line up here and follow us. So it seems to me, from what you've said, he's trying to be everything to everybody. Here. I think that's true. He's trying to be the jack of all trades to everybody. But there's a separate lie for each group of people that he's talking to. Like you said, the Russian people are very smart, so eventually they will catch on to this. But how do they band together if they're if there's se separate interest groups and things like that to you know make some sort of political difference I, I don't have an answer for you i don't know um i talk with so i'm teaching a course in the soviet union right now we talk about this in class all the time i talk about it with my friends my, my other scholarly friends and and colleagues and i can say two things the first is in this political situation now, it is so repressive in Russia, right? Simply using the word war, even in a text message, can send you to, the, to jail for 15 years, right? So um, uh, Russian uh, police are taking people's phones and scrolling through their social media to see if they said anything inappropriate. This is a level of repression that, has, that, that Russia, the Soviet Union, has not seen since the 1940s, right? So it is, it, is, it is a deeply scary time there. It's very scary for my friends who are against Putin and don't know quite what to do. So I don't have an answer for you, but I will, I will say one other thing. And that was uh, in 1990, 1991, when I was first going to the Soviet Union, if you had told me that in December 20, on December 25th, 1991, the Soviet Union would no longer exist, I would have told you you were a fool. So my out on this is to say that I'm a historian, not a political scientist, and certainly not a prophet. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. I cannot see a way for this to happen. But because I can't see it doesn't mean there isn't one. And I have been wrong before. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? I can. When you spoke about the alliance between uh, the Russian Orthodox Church and, and, the, and Putin's regime, it sounded to me like code for blackmail. Um, blackmail, is that what you said? Yeah, it sounded like code for blackmail. It's kind of like so there, there, I think there is kind of an element to this. So you remember that in the Soviet Union, um, the, the Soviet state had taken over all of the, and had nationalized all of the religious uh, property in Russia and had um, turned a lot of churches into bingo halls and granaries and, uh, and, and uh, um, museums and um, dance halls. And so in 1991, the church was desperate to get that real estate back, desperate to get those icons and those chalices back. And so one could, could see that there is a kind of quid pro quo, right? We'll give you back all of this stuff if you support us. I don't think that's completely accurate. I think that the Russian state really was trying to do the right thing, especially at first. It was really trying to make amends 
by giving the church back its 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 land and its property and its and its its goods, its beautiful things, its icons, its art, its its books, and that sort of thing. But I think that as time has gone on, it has become more and more. And I don't know if it's blackmail so much as they've become so entwined that it's hard for either to imagine life without the other. So uh, a friend of mine who knows a lot about this stuff said to me that he, his sense has been that someone else is writing the patriarch's sermons, that they sound so different than his old sermons that, that somebody else is doing it and he's just reading them. That might be, but he's still reading them. He's not, he's not saying he won't do it. You know, that being said, I, I, you know, I'm not in his position, right? I don't know how, how, how I would react in, in that. So there may very well be an element of blackmail there. I think the other thing to remember is that the leadership of the church is not the church, right? In the, in the Orthodox tradition, to have a church, you have to have laity, priests, and bishops. And what we're really talking about is the, the upper level of the bishops. So that is not to say that the laity agree with this or the laity even care. I think there's a long tradition in Russian Orthodoxy to saying, let those people go do whatever they want and we're just gonna do our thing. We're gonna go to church, we're gonna light our candles, we're gonna pray to God, we're gonna baptize our kids, we're gonna get married, we're gonna get, we're gonna get um, uh, buried. So there may be some sort of blackmail or in sort of um, unspoken blackmail going on. But I think that that is only at the very top of the church. I think the vast majority of the church is largely not interested in, in political issues. They may be supportive, they may not be supportive of Putin, but I think it's important to know, to, to know that not only are, is it hard to know what's happening at the top, but that the top and the bottom of the church are not all the same, right? Does that help at all? <laughs> I don't know if that is. We have a question that came in from um, Zoom, and it kind of follows along with what you're asking and talking about now. What role does the schism between the Moscow Patriarchate and the Ecumenical Church in Constantinople play in the current crisis? Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. So. <clears throat> um, there has been a rivalry between the Moscow Patriarch, who believes he ought to be the leader of, the ortho, of orthodoxy in the world, and the Patriarch of Constantinople, who actually is the leader, more or less, of uh, the orthodox in the world. The problem here is that the orthodox are neither like, they're neither the Catholic Church with a single pope, nor they are like, um, Protestant churches with many different organizations. They're somewhere, somewhere in between those. And there's a tradition in the Orthodox Church that more or less national groups are more or less independent, right? And you see that in, in American immigration, right? If you drive um, through uh, Philadelphia, you'll see Russian Orthodox churches, Serbian Orthodox churches, Greek Orthodox churches, Romanian Orthodox churches, Indian Orthodox churches, just in our neighborhood or in our, you know, within a couple of miles, there are all of these different churches. So there's a sense that a national group ought to be more or less independent. But the opposite sense is that the, that the patriarch says, I am the leader of all of the Slavic Orthodox, not just Russian Orthodox, but I am the leader of Ukrainian Orthodox, of Belarusian Orthodox, possibly even Estonian or Latvian or Lithuanian Orthodox. So pretty small churches. But so there, there is a, there is a there, how you define exactly what should ought to be an independent church is not clear in Orthodox. It has never been clear. And the Orthodox are okay with that as a general rule. It's like, yeah, it's a little of this, a little of that. We'll figure it out. But the bigger picture then is, is the rivalry between Moscow, who believes it ought to be the leader, and Constantinople that believes it ought to be or that he ought to be the leader of the Orthodox Church. And when Constantinople offered independence to the Ukrainian church, 
it so ticked off the Russian patriarch that they that the Russian patriarch stopped praying for the the patriarch of Constantinople and told people not to take communion from uh, churches in the from that are led by the patriarch of Constantinople. This is a big deal, right? This is a big thing to do. This is to say, if you're in Greece or something, you shouldn't be taking communion for those people. So uh, I think that that split between the um, the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Patriarch of Moscow over Ukraine was one of the first fissures that then developed into this. It also made it much easier, much easier for Patriarch of Moscow to set to to side with Putin on this because he was already ticked off at the Ukrainian Church and already ticked off at the at Bartholomew, the Patriarch of of Constantinople. Um, this is a this is a really significant thing. This is a big deal in the uh, um, in the world of sort of orthodox government, orthodox ecclesiology. This is a very large issue. Um, it is the biggest issue in many generations, and it simply and it plays very much into the problem in Ukraine. So they are completely and inextricably linked. I think. Hi. Hi. Um you thought the hardships of war, especially on the soldiers and their families, would help people understand the lies. I was wondering about the hardships, economic hardships that people face from our sanctions and the European sanctions. Are they effective or are they bringing them towards Putin, bringing, believing his lie that we're the enemy? I think that that also depends on where you are. So in the same way that most draftees, most conscripts tend to be coming from the smaller um, rural areas, uh, the economic hardship of the, uh, um, of the sanctions is hitting the urban areas, it's hitting the large urban areas. And um, without question, it's affecting people. Absolutely, without question. One of the things that Russians have been most excited about, most proud of, most um, pleased with in the last 20 years has been in the cities, the integration of the Russian cities into life in European cities. So when I first started going to Moscow, it was very difficult to find food anywhere. I can remember walking around. I remember taking a friend, <laughs> this is wonderful, in the fall of 1990 into the only Baskin and Robbins in Moscow. And you had to be let in like a jeweler's um, store, a jewelry store to get to buy ice cream. Ice cream is very popular, uh, not only with me, but with uh, Russians in, in, in general. And you had to use American dollars to do so. Uh, when I was back on the last time I was in, in Moscow, I was stunned, even though I knew it would happen, I was stunned by how Moscow was Russian, but it felt completely, absolutely European. It could have been Paris, it could have been Rome, right? It could have been London that it felt like just a normal European city with the stores and the restaurants and the feeling on the street and the people talking on their cell phones. And all of that is gone. The Russians in the cities feel that very much. And my friends certainly who are part of sort of the intelligentsia in Russia very strongly feel that they have been cut off from a world that they had come to embrace and to love. So I think that the, uh, um, for the time being that the economic sanctions, which are awful, but which I personally, not that anyone cares, completely support. And I think, by the by, that the Biden administration has been nothing less than heroic in this, as has the, U the EU and NATO. I think it's been unbelievable in, in what's happened. But that being said, I think that those are, are hitting the cities the most, and that um, the other problems, the problems of young boys coming back dead are hitting the countryside the most. So I think it's kind of a two, a, a, a two different pictures. Yeah. In uh, 2014, in the Donbas uh, southeastern portion of Ukraine, the loyal Russians uh, wanting to return to Russia uh, fought the resistance and 14,000 people were killed. Uh, does the Donbas area with these uh, types of people that are anti-Ukraine provide a roadblock for the current president of Ukraine to, to proceed? Yes and no. 
I think. Um, I think the no is perhaps stronger than the yes in some ways. Um, to my mind, the Donbass problem was largely created by Russia. Uh -huh. And it was largely created by Russia as a way to take the heat off Russia's desire to take Crimea, right? Crimea is a much bigger prize than, than the Donbass is. Um, were there, are there people who live in the Donbass, were they more pro-Russian than people in central or Western Ukraine? Yes, absolutely, no question about it. Were there separatists there? Yeah, you bet there were. Um, did they, should they have had special representation in the Ukrainian government? Maybe so. But I'm not sure that it will actively change the situation with one exception to that. And I think that it is, it is possible that ultimately, if the Ukrainian government is going to give up any um, land, uh, I would agree that it ought to, but if it were, it might be slightly easier in the Donbass than it would be in, in, in Crimea or other parts of, of, uh, of Ukraine, um, just because it's been such a difficult place for so long. But it's a really, really thorny question and I don't have a great answer for you. would like to return to the very beginning of your talk and ask if you have an opinion as to why, why Putin attacked Ukraine in late February. What, what, was, what would be his goal in not only attacking the Donbas, or, or uh, peripheral areas, but sending the Russian army toward um, Kiev and uh, destroying huge swaths of urban areas. What is his goal? His goal, I think, ultimately is to return Ukraine to what he thinks of as a new Russian empire. I think his goal is to make Ukraine an integral part of a new Russian empire, to an expanded Russian empire. In the same way that Catherine the Great took over some of the Cossack lands in the 18th century and made that part of, part of Russia. That being said, I agree with all of my friends and colleagues who have talked about this you know, on and off through on phone calls and in Zoom and, and, um, and on Facebook and in emails that I cannot fathom how he thought it was going to work. I understand what he wanted. I think what he wants to be is an incarnation in Nicholas I, the, uh, the Tsar who, who uh, reigned from 1825 to 1855, 54, 55 and who, by the way, uh, lost a war in Crimea, in Ukraine, uh, at the end of his reign. Um, I believe that the closest thing that I can understand to Putin's perception of the world is that of Nicholas I, that the Russian state, the Russian Tsar, and the Russian church have a sacred duty to expand. But I can't he, Putin 15 years ago would have, not know, would have known that this was impossible. There is something different now in Vladimir Putin than there was say 20 years ago. I don't know if the, he's sick. There, I've, read, I've read rumors that he has um, Parkinson's disease. Certainly he has looked puffy as if maybe he's been taking a lot of prednisolone. Um, I, I don't know, but there is something different. And that, that, that something different st stopped making him a, 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 um, a canny, rational player, one that you might not agree with, but at least you thought was working from a rational way to someone that I simply cannot understand. I don't get it. So I think I know his goal, but I can't imagine why he thought it was gonna work. 
I know you've already said you're not a poli sci guy, but nonetheless. Um, so you would mentioned some of the other countries that, that border Russia and that have been part of the USSR. Are the, their Russian border folks also at risk for this type of situation? Or is this gonna be like, hey, everybody who speaks German should be part of Germany? Attitude of yours, um, or do they just go after Ukraine because they need the source of food? So um, I think Ukraine was to Putin's eyes, he, it was both the biggest prize and the easiest prize. Um, that uh, there are other prizes that he would like to have. He would like Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania without question in my mind. He would like Georgia and Armenia without question in, the, in my mind. But those are now NATO countries. And so I think that Ukraine was just an, e it was the easiest one from his point of view. And it was the one that, that was, that bothered him the most because he thought of Ukrainians as being the closest to being like Russians in a way that Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Georgians, and, and Armenians are not. Um, I think right now, the group that is probably most likely to be worried would be the Moldovans. Um, uh, which is, has a large Russian speaking population in it, has really no significant army at all, um, and is right at the edge of, of Ukraine. Um, I was, I've been reading uh, lately though that the Moldovans um, have been breathing a lot easier in the last few weeks because the, the Russian army is not nearly as impressive as, as, as they thought it was going to be. Um, but if there is, if there is a, a group that, is, that ought to be afraid, I think it would be the Moldovans. Yeah, one last question from Zoom. Thanks. How do Russian middle or lower class reconcile their standard of living and or reduction in it with what their leaders are saying? So, I think that that might be related in some part by class and by geography. So the largest number of people leaving Russia right now are urban middle-class Russians. Um, the IT infrastructure of Russia is moving abroad. Hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of people are leaving right now. People, I have friends who have applied for visas to the, to, uh, the European Union who two months ago would have said, I will never leave Russia. I would never imagine leave, leaving Russia. I have friends who have sent me their students because the students and their families have now moved to Armenia and, the, and their professors have said, you know, maybe you're going to be their advisor now because it's gonna be harder for me once they close down the internet to advise these students who are gone. So the middle class, I think understood very quickly, the urban middle class, and that is um, where the brain drain is happening. Without question, that's where the brain drain is happening. Um, so the, there are hundreds of thousands of, of, of uh, Russians who are leaving right now, even as we speak, moving to Georgia uh, and Armenia and, and Turkey, and then in lesser numbers because you need visas to uh, Finland and, and further west. Um, I think that the response that Putin wants other Russians, he'd like all Russians, but he wants other Russians to, to, to have, is to say, see, they're doing it again. They're making us suffer. And the more they make us suffer, the more we know that Russians in our soul can suffer, that we know how to suffer better than anybody can suffer, ask my mother. Um, the, uh, uh, that we can, we can, we, we are great suffering, and, and without question, right? 20 to 27 million people died, right? So there was, and there has been tremendous suffering. So I think that the argument that he is using, I don't think so, I know the argument that he is using is, this is just the best way to make us suffer some more, and that will do nothing but make us stronger, right? He said, those people who leave are like uh, flies that have flown into our mouth and will just spit out. But the rest of us will stay behind and will suffer and will make a more glorious Russia as a result. It's scary, it's scary stuff. All right, so I'm conscious of our time this evening and your time for being here. Uh, I'm going to ask one last question and then we will uh, close the evening. And uh, I don't know if you have a few minutes to stay around if people want to say hello Maybe or anything fine, like yeah. that. Um, last question is in the breadth of information that we are all receiving on this, is there or are there 
um, sources or people that we should be listening to, paying attention to either from Russia, Ukraine, acad academics, people yeah. that we should be listening to? So I would say two things. One is would be news sources. Um, and I've been finding that I, 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 uh, um, I, I've been reading a lot of the New York Times. Um, I've been reading the Guardian quite a lot. I've been reading the Times of London a little bit less. I've been reading the Post maybe a little bit less. Um, uh, unusually, I think, for, for the kind of paper it is, um, the Wall Street Journal has had really excellent reporting um, from inside of, inside of Ukraine. Um, this is the, that's quite different from their, their uh, opinion page, but their reporting has been very strong. Um, I actually watch uh, Zelensky every day on, on, uh, um, on Instagram. Uh, I, I, I don't have TikTok and I'm slightly afraid of what that is. So I don't, uh, I don't watch him on TikTok, movie. but I do watch him. His TikTok things also get put on, on Instagram. Um, and uh, the, uh, there are a number of scholarly organizations. If you're interested in scholarly kind of stuff, that are really good. There's one um, specifically, my sort of home organization is called ACES. Let me see if I can get this right. The Association for Study, no, for Soviet East European and Eurasian Studies, A-S-E-E-E-S dot -E -E org. And they do a great job at putting things together and showing you place to go. Some things are in Russian, some things are Ukrainian, some things are, are in, in English. Um, uh, I've also been spending quite a lot of time, much more time than I've ever spent my life on Facebook, oddly enough, um, because a lot of people from around the world are uh, not only talking about face, talking about things on Facebook, but they're also posting other ways to get information. So I would say that, um, well, this, for example, was posted on, on Facebook, both on the, the church's Facebook and Lance on Proud Facebook and my own Facebook page. Um, but it was, but also I, I would say at least once a day and more often three or four times a day, if you just look for Ukraine, if you just put in Ukraine, you'll see um, scholars who say, I'm speaking here, or there's going to be a Zoom session there. And I have found that to be incredibly, incredibly useful. Um, it's hard to find good Russian sources because most of them are either in Russian, and so they're hard to get at, um, or they've been closed down. So even the independent um, Newspapers, uh, there was one independent newspaper that, that uh, published both in English and in Russian every day. They published perfectly the exact same thing in English and Russian every day, and it's been closed. It's, it closed down three weeks ago. Um, uh, the Russian radio stations, independent radio stations have been closed. Um, the Russian uh, um, TV stations have been closed. So it's pretty tough to get some of that. Um, some of them are coming back to as much as they can on YouTube, but, my tendency is New York Times, The Guardian, The Wall Street Journal, which I don't even like to say, being as I am, not a business guy. Um, uh, and um, I think Facebook has been really helpful and Instagram have been, have been really helpful. I mean, all of the stuff you have to, you have to think through yourself, but, but uh, uh, social media, I think, has really come into its own in, in many ways. And I think a lot of scholars and a lot of people are just interested are using social media in some very important ways. Um, the other thing you might wanna know is that uh, this region has a huge, very active Ukrainian community up near where I work in Abington. So sort of the Jenkintown area, Elkins Park area has a huge and very active Ukrainian population. There's a big Ukrainian Catholic church there, big Ukrainian Orthodox church there. Um, and so you might watch things like in the Inquirer or you know, web pages or something like that, that they have activities going on up there too. Yeah. Does that help at all? That's yeah. It's very helpful. Thank you so much. Cool. Uh, that's going to conclude us this evening uh, for the the formal portion of this. Dr. Robson, thank you yeah. so much for thank, coming this tonight. Thank you so much for caring about this. Thank you.
Thank you. 